Purgatory, Chapter 34 Matter of Expiation, Negligence, and Holy Communion To tepidity is allied negligence in the preparation for the Eucharistic banquet. If the Church unceasingly calls her children to the Holy Table, if she desires that they communicate frequently, she always intends that they should do so with fervor and piety, which so great a mystery demands. All voluntary neglect in so holy an action is an offense to the sanctity of Jesus Christ, an offense which must be repaired by just expiation. Venerable Louis of Bilolis, in his Memoir Spirituel, speaks of a great servant of God who learned in a supernatural manner how severe these faults are punished in the other life. He received a visit from a soul in purgatory, imploring his aid in name of his friendship by which they have formerly been united. She endured, she said, horrible torments for the negligence with which she had prepared for Holy Communion during the days of her earthly pilgrimage. She could not be delivered but by a fervent communion which would compensate for her former tepidity. Her friend hastened to gratify her desire received Holy Communion with great purity of conscience, with all the faith and devotion possible, and then she saw the Holy Soul appear, brilliant with incomparable splendor, and rise towards heaven. In the year 1589, in the monastery of St. Mary of the Angels in Florence, died a religious who was much esteemed by her sisters in religion, but soon appeared to St. Magdalene de Pazzi, who implored her assistance in the rigorous purgatory to which she was condemned. The saint was in prayer before the Blessed Sacrament when she perceived the deceased kneeling in the middle of the church in an attitude of profound adoration. She had around her a mantle of flames that seemed to consume her, but a white robe that covered her body protected her in part from the action of the fire. Greatly astonished, Magdalene desired to know what this signified, and she was answered that this soul suffered thus for having had little devotion towards the august sacrament of the altar. Notwithstanding the rules of the holy customs of her order, she had communicated but rarely, and then with indifference. It was for this reason divine justice had condemned her to come every day to adore the blessed sacrament, and to submit to the torture of fire at the feet of Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, in reward for her virginal purity, represented by the white robe, her divine spouse had greatly mitigated her sufferings. Such was the revelation which God made to his servant. She was deeply touched, and made every effort to assist the poor soul by all the suffrages in her power. She often related this apparition, and made use of it to exhort her spiritual daughters to zeal for Holy Communion. Purgatory, Chapter 35 Matter of Expiation Want of Respect in Prayer We should treat holy things in a holy manner. All irreverence in religious exercises is extremely displeasing to God. When the Venerable Agnes of Lesanc of whom we have already spoken, was prioress of her convent, she very much recommended to her religious respect and fervor in their relations with God, reminding them of these words of Holy Scripture, A curse be he that doth the work of God with negligence. A sister of the community named Angelique died. The pious superior was praying near her tomb, when she suddenly saw the deceased sister before her, dressed in the religious habit, she felt at the same time as though a flame of fire touched her face. Sister Angelique thanked her for having stimulated her to fervor, and in particularly for having frequently made her repeat during life these words, A curse be he that doth the work of God with negligence. Continue, mother, she added, to urge the sisters to fervor, let them serve God with the utmost diligence. Love him with their whole heart and with all the power of their soul. If they could but understand how rigorous are the torments of purgatory, 
they would never be guilty of the least neglect. The foregoing warning regards in a special manner priests whose relations with God are continual and more sublime. Let them, therefore, remember it always, and never forget it, whether they offer to God the incense of prayer, whether they dispense the divine treasures of the sacraments, or whether at the altar they celebrate the mysteries of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. See what St. Peter Damian relates in his 14th letter to Desirius. St. Servian, Bishop of Cologne, edified his church by an example of all virtues. His apostolic life, his great labors for the extension of God's kingdom in souls, have merited for him the honors of canonization. Nevertheless, after his death, he appeared to one of his canons of his cathedral to ask for prayers. This worthy priest, not being able to understand a holy prelate, such as he has shown Severin to be, could stand in need of prayers in the other life. The deceased bishop replied, It is true God gave me grace to serve him with all my heart, and to labor in his vineyard, but I often offended him by the haste with which I recited the office. The occupations of each day so absorbed my attention that when the hour of prayer came, I acquitted myself of that great duty without recollection, and sometimes at another hour than that appointed by the church. At this moment I am expiating those infidelities, and God permits me to come and ask for your prayers. The biography adds that Severin was six months in purgatory for that one fault. Venerable Sister Frances of Pampeluna, whom we have before mentioned, one day saw at purgatory a poor priest, whose fingers were eaten away by frightful ulcers. He was thus punished for having at the altar made the sign of the cross with too much levity and without the necessary gravity. He said that in general priests remain in purgatory longer than laymen, and that the intensity of their torments is in proportion to their dignity. God revealed to her the fate of several deceased priests. One of them had to undergo forty years of suffering for having by his neglect allowed a person to die without the sacraments. Another remained for forty-five years for having performed the sublime functions of his ministry with a certain levity. A bishop, whose liberality caused him to be named almoner, was detained there for five years for having sought that dignity. Another, not so charitable, was condemned for forty years for the same reason. God wills that we should serve him with our whole heart, and that we should avoid, in so far as the frailty of human nature will permit, even the slightest imperfections, but the care to please him and the fear of displeasing him must be accompanied by a humble confidence in his mercy. Jesus Christ has admonished us, to hear those whom he has appointed in his place to be our spiritual guides as we should himself, and to follow the advice of our superior or confessor with perfect confidence. Thus an excessive fear is an offense against his mercy. On November 12, 1643, Father Philip Street of the Society of Jesus, a religious of great sanctity, died in the novitiate of Brunn in Bohemia. Every day he made his examination of conscience with great care and acquired by this means great purity of soul. Some hours after his death he appeared all radiant to one of the fathers of his order, Venerable Martin Streda. One single fault, he said, prevents me from going to heaven and detains me here eight hours in purgatory. It is that of not having sufficiently confided in the words of my superior, who in the last moments of my life strove to calm some little trouble of conscience, ought to have regarded his words as the voice of God himself. Purgatory, Chapter 36 Matter of Expiation and Chastisement Immortification of the Senses Christians who wish to escape the rigors of purgatory 
must love the mortification of their divine master and beware of being delicate members under a head crowned with thorns. On February 10, 1656, in the province of Lyons, Father Francis of Aix, of the Society of Jesus, passed away to a better life. He carried all the virtues of a religious to a high degree of perfection. Penetrated with a profound veneration towards the most blessed trinity, he had for particular intention in all his prayers and mortifications to honor this august mystery, to embrace by preference those works for which others show less inclination, had a particular charm for him. He often visited the Blessed Sacrament even during the night, and never left the door of his room without going to say a prayer at the foot of the altar. His penances, which were in a manner excessive, gave him the name of the man of suffering. He replied to one who advised him to moderate them, The day which I shall allow to pass without shedding some drops of my blood to offer to my God will be for me the most painful and most severest mortification, since I cannot hope to suffer martyrdom for the love of Jesus Christ. I will at least have some part in his sufferings. Another religious, brother coadjutor of the same order, did not imitate the example of this good father. He had little love of mortification, but on the contrary, sought his ease and comfort and all that could gratify his senses. This brother some days after his death appeared to Father de X, clothed in frightful haircloth, and suffered great torments in punishment for the faults of sensuality which he had committed during life. He implored the assistance of his prayers and immediately disappeared. Another fault against which we must guard, because we so easily fall into it, is the unmortification of the tongue. Oh, how easy it is to err in words! How rare is a thing is it to speak for any length of time without offending at least against meekness! humility, sincerity, or a Christian charity. Even pious persons are often subject to this defect. When they have escaped all the other snares of the demon, they allow themselves to be taken away, says St. Jerome, in this last trap, slander. Let us listen to what is related by Vincent de Beveris. When the celebrated Durand, who in the 11th century shed luster in the order of St. Dominic, was yet a simple religious. He showed himself a model of regularity and fervor, yet he had one defect. The vivacity of his disposition led him to talk too much. He was excessively fond of witty expressions, often at the expense of charity. Hugh's abbot brought this under his notice, even predicting that, if he did not correct himself of this fault, he would certainly have to expiate it in purgatory. Durand did not attach sufficient importance to this advice, and continued to give himself, without much restraint, to the disorders of the tongue. After his death, the prediction of the abbot Hugh was fulfilled. Durand appeared to a religious, one of his friends, imploring him to assist him by his prayers because he was frightfully punished for the unmortification of his tongue. In consequence of this apparition, the members of the community unanimously agreed to observe strict silence for eight days and to practice other good works for the repose of the deceased. These charitable exercises produced their effect. Some time after, Durand again appeared, but now to announce his deliverance. Purgatory, Chapter 37, Matter of Expiation, Intemperance of the Tongue We have just seen how immoderation of the use of words is expiated in purgatory. Father P. Rossingioli speaks of a Dominican religious who incurred the chastisements of divine justice for a like defect. This religious, a preacher full of zeal, a glory to his order, appeared after his death to one of his brethren at Cologne. He was clad in magnificent robes, wearing a crown of gold upon his head, but his tongue was fearfully tormented. 
These ornaments represented the recompense of his zeal for souls and his perfect exactitude in all the points of his rule. Nevertheless, his tongue was tortured, because he had not been sufficiently guarded in his words, and his language was not always becoming the sacred lips of a priest and a religious. The following instance is drawn from Caesareus. In a monastery of the order of Coutel, says this author, lived two young religious named Gertrude and her sister Margaret. The former, although otherwise virtuous, did not sufficiently watch over her tongue. She frequently allowed herself to transgress the rule of silence prescribed sometimes even in choir, before and after the chanting of the office. Instead of recollecting herself with a reverence due to that holy place, she addressed useless words to her sister, who was placed next to her, so that besides her violation of the rule of silence and her lack of piety, she was also subject to disedification of her companion. She died while still young, and a very short time after her death, Sister Margaret, on going to office, saw her come and place herself in the same stall she had occupied whilst living. At this sight, the sister was almost about to faint. When she had sufficiently recovered from her astonishment, she went and told the superior what she had seen. The superior told her not to be troubled, but should the deceased appear again, to ask her, in the name of God, why she came. She reappeared the next day in the same way, and according to the order of the prioress, Margaret said to her, My dear sister Gertrude, whence do you come, and what do you want? I come, she said, to satisfy the justice of God in this place where I have sinned. It was here in this holy sanctuary that I offended God by words, both useless and contrary to religious respect, by disedification to all, and by the scandal which I have given you in particular. Oh, if you knew, she added, what I suffer. I am devoured by flames. My tongue especially is dreadfully tormented. Then she disappeared, after having asked for some prayers. When St. Hugh, who succeeded St. Odolo in 1049, governed the fervent monastery of Culney, one of his religious, who had been careless in the observance of the rule of silence, having died, appeared to the holy abbot to beg the assistance of his prayers. His mouth was filled with frightful ulcers, in punishment, he said, for idle words. Hugh imposed seven days of silence upon his community. They were passed in recollection and prayer. Then the deceased reappeared, freed from his ulcers, his countenance radiant, and testifying his gratitude for the charitable succor he had received from his brethren. If such is the chastisement of idle words, what will be that of words more culpable 